So in today's topic, in chapter six, which is about normal probability distributions, we're looking at 6.3. In 6.1, we introduce the standard normal distribution with the idea of that bell-shaped curve and a standard deviation of one and a mean of zero would mean that the score on that distribution is called a z-score. Then in 6.2, we said, well, we can use this idea for any normal distribution, even if it's not standard. And we can convert a score for an individual piece of data, an x value, into a z-score. And then we can make predictions about what portion of the sample or the population would be above or below that value based on a normal distribution. So for 6.3, in sampling distributions and estimators, we're going to make a big leap. And here's the idea of what we're beginning to tackle in today's topic. And then we'll look at their definitions and demonstration for how to think about doing this. So all along, I think just from chapter one in the very beginning, the idea of statistics that we've been chasing is that you have a population that you want to investigate, like all the students at DVC, and you have some parameter you're curious about, like how tall students are at DVC. And then the idea was that we would take a sample of that population and look at what we see about the sample with the idea of then trying to infer something about the population but the sample will uh, help us draw conclusions about the population. So for example, I'm curious what the average height of all students at DVC is, how, what's the mean height. Then I would take a sample of 100 students at DVC using various sampling techniques, hoping that my sample is fairly reflective uh, of the overall population. And then I could look at the mean height of my sample and imagine that maybe that's pretty close to the mean height of the actual population that the statistic would be a good approximation of the parameter. The, the value for the sample is a good way to approximate the value for the entire population. Well, now we're going to take that idea on more mathematically rigorously. And so the idea is, well, how do you know whether it's a good approximation for the population or not? Because when you take a sample, even if you're trying to take a, a perfectly randomized sample, there is still going to be random fluctuations in which sample from the population you get. For example, if I'm trying to get an idea for the mean height of students at DVC and I just randomly grab 100 people, well, I wouldn't expect that the mean value of my sample would be exactly the same as the mean of the population because I just happened to randomly grab 100 people. I'm expecting that there would be some expected deviation away from the actual mean value of the population. And that hopefully half the time my sample's mean might be a little too high and half the time it might be a little too low but that in general, if I imagine all the different ways that I could take samples of students and look at the mean, that if half of them were too high and half of them were too low, that the, the average result of all the different kinds of samples that I could take would be the same as the actual value of the population. So what we're going to begin to look at is imagining all the different ways you could take samples and when you looked at the statistic, like the mean value from all the different possible samples you could take, what do those sample means look like when you look at a distribution? Do you get a normal distribution when you're getting means of samples, meaning the mean value of this sample and the mean value of that sample and all these different mean values? So we're no longer looking at individual values from the population we're looking at mean values from groups or samples of the population and then making a distribution of those values. 
as an example. And there's three different statistics that we're going to consider taking samples and looking at. So one is called a proportion. So if I take a sample of 100 students from the population, I can say, well, what portion of my sample had a certain answer? And let's, the simplest way to think of that is like a yes, no question. Uh, so I could say, for example, I took a sample of 100 students from DVC and I looked at what portion of my sample said that they're Democrats. And let's say it's 40%. Then I could take another sample of a different 100 students and ask the same question. And maybe in that sample, the portion that said they were Democrats falls to 30%. And then I could take another randomly chosen 100 people, and maybe in that one, it's 52% or 80% or whatever. Every time I take a different sample, I would suspect that I would get perhaps a slightly different portion of that sample that claimed to be a Democrat. Then I could take all of those proportion values and make a distribution. And I could look at the mean value of the sample proportions of Democrats and then guess that perhaps the mean of the samples of all I got would be close or even equal to the mean for the entire population, meaning not the mean, but the proportion from the entire population of how many students say that they're Democrats. So I can do that for a proportion. I can do that for the mean value of something like average height. I could take a sample, see the average height of my sample, then take a different sample, get a different average, get another sample, get a different average, then I could average all those averages. I could take the mean of the sample means. And then lastly, I could take a sample and look uh, for some numerical statistic. And then I could look at the standard deviation of, for say, for example, the heights of my sample. And I could get a different sample and get a different standard deviation and a different sample and get a different sample standard deviation. And maybe the mean of those sample standard deviations might be usable to predict the standard deviation of the entire population. That's the big conceptual step that we're taking forward today. So I tried to use a simple, couple simple examples to describe the idea. Now they're gonna walk us through some definitions. They're going to introduce a bunch of notation to try to explore all of these things and it will be easy to get lost. So try to keep an idea in mind of what we're chasing today. Please feel free to interrupt at any time if you have a question to give me an opportunity if I've left things confusing to clarify things for you, okay? Any questions at all before we begin going down into the slideshow and getting lots of definitions and things? Sure, can I just quickly um, clarify that basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna take uh, multiple samples and get the means from those samples and then get the means from basically the means of all those samples together to get a better idea of the entire population? Uh, yes and no. So the no part is that in general, that's not how we do statistics. We don't usually have the luxury of taking multiple samples of 100 people. And actually we don't need to. But if we were able to take samples of 500 people, instead of doing five samples of 100, we would just do one huge sample of 500. So. We are not going to do that, but we're exploring the idea of how samples would vary. Because if we begin to think about how different samples introduce random variations in the statistic we're investigating, then we can look at mathematically how we can use that fact to, from a single sample, make a probabilistic or probability statement predicting what the real value is of the population from our sample. In other words, because we have to recognize that when we just take a sample, 
there's a possibility of random variances in what results you get when you pick a random sample. But once we understand the idea behind that, then from a single sample, we can say, well, due to the fact that this was randomly chosen, I believe the real value of the population isn't necessarily exactly what I got in my sample, but it should be fairly close. And in chapter seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11, we'll talk about being able to make statements like, from my one sample, the average height was five, six. And because of the size of my sample and possible random variations in samples, I believe I can predict fairly certainly, with fair certainty, that the actual height of the average height of students at DVC will be around 5'6", and I'm going to say with fair certainty that it's between 5'4 and 5'8", something like that. So just to keep in mind why we're looking at these ideas in 6'3", in is our primary goal, for example, in chapter seven will be to make something called a confidence interval. Like, we're not gonna be able to say for a population, this is the value of the, the mean height of students because we don't, we're not taking every height of every student. So what we end up doing instead is we make statements like, we're 90% sure that the actual mean height of students at DVC is between 5'6 and 5'10. That's called a confidence interval. And the way we can produce a range of values and a level of certainty that the actual value from everybody is within this range, even though I only looked at 100 students, is with the concepts that we're introducing today. Does that make better sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. All right, so the big idea we're thinking about is the fact that when you take a random sample, the result you get from your random sample cannot be expected to be exactly the same as for the entire population. So we're gonna look now when you take different samples, what kind of fluctuations you get and what's a good way to make a prediction about the overall population from a sample. Other questions before we dive in a little further here. All right, so let's get at it. So key concept, we now consider the concept of sampling distribution of a statistic. So the statistic might be the proportion of the population that says they're a Democrat. When you take a population, some proportion would say they're Democrat, 40%, 50%, whatever it is. When you take a sample from that population, you get a statistic. Remember, statistic is a measurement from your sample. A parameter is a measurement from your population. So when they say specifically here, sampling distribution of a statistic, they're saying you had some statistic from a sample, but you're distributing the different sample statistic values you would get if you took different samples. So instead of working with values from the original population and, and, and distributing all of those, like here's all the heights from my population, we want to focus on the values of statistics, such as sample proportions or sample means obtained from the population. General behavior of sampling distributions. There's four points to this. When samples of the same size are taken from the same population, like 100 students from DVC, from the DVC student population, then a different 100 students, then a different 100 students. So different samples, but all my samples are 100 students in size. And they're all from the population of students at DVC. The following two properties apply. Sample proportions tend to be normally distributed. So again, I'm imagining a bell-shaped curve, but what's along the scale on the bottom are the results I got from each of my 100 student samples. So if I take 100 students and 40% said they were Democrats, then maybe 
uh, if I do that a bunch of times for a bunch of different samples of size 100, then I can distribute what each of those proportions were. And maybe most of them end up being around 45%. And then maybe there were some samples that were more up in the 50% range. And there were some samples that were more down in the 40% range, meaning some samples where I took 100 students and 40% of them said that they're Democrats. So the different portions of the samples that are randomly chosen, if I take the results from all those different samples and make a distribution, that it will be normally distributed. There'll be a higher uh, a higher number of those samples around some middle value. And then as you leave that middle value, then they will diminish in how many samples were in those more extreme value ranges. Then number two, the mean of the sample proportions is the same as the population mean. Now it could be, uh, I think this should be proportion. As usual, some of these slides need a little bit of an adjustment. So if I take proportions from all of my different samples and I think of every possible sample that I could take, and there would be lots and lots and lots of those, um, we would never be able to take them all. But mathematically, if you theoretically took every possible sample of 100, and looked at every proportion of all those samples and distributed them out, well, then you could get a mean of those proportions. You could add them all up and divide by how many there are. And the mean value of the sample proportions that you got is the proportion of the population itself who would say that they're Democrats. So if I look at all possible samples of 100 and I took all of the mean of all of those proportions and let's say the mean turned out to be 45, and that was right in the middle of my normal distribution of sample proportions, that would mean that that is because the actual proportion of the populations is 45%. And it kind of makes sense because if the actual proportion of the population is 45% and you just randomly grab 100 people and you think of all the different ways you could randomly grab 100 people, well, you would think of half of the time you would randomly happen to get proportions a little above the real proportion and half the time you'd randomly get proportions from a sample that are a little below the actual proportion because it is possible and expected that you would deviate from the real value but if they're chosen randomly, you would deviate equally sometimes above or sometimes below the real value. Questions, comments, discussions about that? So when samples of the same size are taken from the same population, the following two properties apply. Sample proportions, the values you get from all the different samples tend to be normally distributed, meaning if you make a distribution of the sample values, you get a normal distribution. And the mean of all of those sample results is the same as the value for the population itself. So they're going to try to take some slides to think about this and wrap your minds around this and show you a picture. And I think this is very helpful if you can take the time to think about what it's showing you, but when you first look at it, it's very overwhelming. So again, let's, take, let's say we are talking about taking a sample and looking at the proportion of my sample that call themselves Democrats. So for each sample, there'll be some P value for proportion. They're labeling this like P hat as the sample proportion. And I'm gonna say, we'll say of Democrats just to keep our example in mind. So imagine 
that you have a sampling procedure. Randomly select n values, find the proportion p hat for each sample. And so you could do this with sample one, sample two, sample three. You could just keep taking samples. The population proportion, they're just going to call p without the little hat symbol on it. So then you would get a different proportion for each sample that you took. 40% for one sample, 45% for another sample, 50% for another sample. And you can imagine collecting all of those samples from all of the different ways you could randomly select 100. Then all of those different results, you could then make a distribution. So then it says sample proportions, the rep proportions from each of your samples tend to have a normal distribution. So this is a distribution of the sample proportions, not the proportion of a population, but samples of that population and the proportions each of those had. Well, if you imagine all the different kind of proportions that you could get and you listed them all out in a distribution, well, then you could take the mean of those proportions. 40%, 45%, 50%, 52%, 38%. You could add, add those up and divide by how many there were. And the mean, since these are normally distributed, the mean would be right in the middle. Uh, they're going to move on to sample means. So what we just saw from the slide above is the mean of sample proportions is the same as the population proportion. So this would be that the mean of the p sub hats is equal to p, the actual population proportion. So that if I did this distribution of all the sample proportions I could get, P would be right in the middle. And P is for the entire population, the proportion of the entire population that says they're Democrats. So the idea being that if I take a sample of 100, well, as you can imagine, I could get a value higher than P for the proportion of my sample. I could get a value lower than P, the actual population value. But that most of the samples I get should be within some fair range of the P value of the population. It's possible I could get some sample that's way over here that has a much higher proportion of Democrats than the actual population. But the farther you get away from the actual proportion, the less likely it is that that will occur. If 40% of my population were Democrats, what's the chance if I take 100 students that all of them would be Democrats and that my proportion for my sample would be 100%? Well, that's a binomial calculation. You may recall that's extremely unlikely extremely unlikely. I would go into the binomial calculator and I'd have to put in a success of 40% and say, what's the chance with 100 trials that every one of them hit the 40%? That's astronomically small probability. It's almost an impossibility. And so the idea is, is that what's most likely when you take a sample of 100 students is that the proportion of your sample is maybe not too far from the actual population proportion. And we're now thinking about exactly how far away it's likely to be so that we can then draw conclusions about the actual population. And the, the conclusion will be something like, we think it's fairly certain it's the actual value is not too far from the value of our sample. And here's a range we think that actually includes the real value from the population. So the next slide is this exact same thing, but instead of taking sample proportions, we're gonna take sample means. But let me just see if there's any questions, comments, or discussions.
about our example of sample proportions in this case of Democrats and this slide that we're looking at. Any questions at all? All right, so if from my sample, instead of simply asking people, are you a Democrat and seeing what portion of my sample is a Democrat, as we've discussed before, I could say, I could measure how tall somebody is. And then I would get numerical data of 67 inches or something like that. And then I could look at the mean height of my sample. So now we're talking about sampling means, sample means. Again, we take samples of 100 students at DVC or whatever it is. And for each sample we take, we can take all of the data from our sample and find the mean of that sample. So that would give us the sample means. And for every sample, there would be a different one. And every time I change to a different 100 students, I would potentially get a different sample mean. I might get the same mean multiple times. But when I distribute all of those sample means, they tend to have a normal distribution. They tend to lump up and be more likely to occur around some middle value, a mean value. And I could take the mean of all those sample means. So I again, would imagine that in the middle here, there would be a mean of means, the mean of the sample means. The mean of the sample means, the average of the averages, the average of the sample averages, the mean of the sample means. So what we're going to conclude here is that the mean of all the sample means is the same as the population mean. So the mean of the sample means is equal to the mu that we've always used to refer to the mean of the population. So if I imagine all the different mean heights I could get from different samples of 100 students, if I take the mean of those sample means, I will get the average or the mean height of my all DVC students' heights. And further, I would expect that the most likely occurrence when I take a sample of students is that the mean of my sample will be fairly close to the actual mean of the entire population. And that it's much less likely that I'll get a sample mean that deviates very far from the actual mean of the population. And we will learn mathematically how to be precise about that in the coming chapters. Questions, comments, discussions about that? So, so this is, um, it's, it's not an exact thing. It's more of an approximation, but extremely close to, to what we're trying to go for, correct? So, uh, the only way to exactly know the mean of a population is to know every value and take the mean. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. So to say that statistics doesn't give you exact values, that is true. But that doesn't mean that the mathematics is not exact because instead what we will give you is exactly correct probability statements. And that's why the probability chapter was important. So for example, um, trying to think of a way to describe an example without using too much of what we still have yet to learn. Um, so if I am flipping a coin and I'm gonna flip it 10 times, we know due to theoretical probability that the probability of getting heads is 
and that the expected number of times that you would get heads if you flipped a coin 10 times would be five. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's exact, right? There's no ambiguity about that. That's an exact value. The probability of getting heads is 50%. That's exact. But what happens when you flip a coin 10 times? Does this guarantee that you're going to get five heads? Of course not. You could easily get four or six because they're pretty close to five. But you could also get 10 heads, but that wouldn't be so easy. That would be much more rare. That would be, you know, less than one in a thousand chance that that will happen. So basically the idea is you can make probability statements about how many times you would get heads if you use a binomial distribution. As we learned in binomial distributions in chapter five, I could say, well, what's the probability if I flip a coin 10 times that I get either four, five or six heads? And it would be a pretty high probability <coughs> because five is the most likely outcome and four and the six are the next most likely outcomes. And so I have a pretty good probability of getting between four and six. I still might not, but I have a range of values in which I can give an idea of how likely that outcome would be. I can give a probability statement. Like you're gonna, 78% of the time, you're gonna get four or five or six when you flip a coin 10 times and count the heads or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's a helpful distinction, thank you. Okay, so now what this does in statistics is we basically work that backward because those probability statements are predictions about the future. Like, well, since I know all of the probabilistic situation of flipping coins, I can make predictions about the future. And in the long run, those are gonna come out to be true. But the problem with statistics when we just take one sample and we're looking at a population is that we are trying to use probabilities to make a statement about the population. What's true about the population is an exact value, but we practically don't have a way of getting it. I mean, obviously you can get it with a census, but as we've seen, census are very expensive and usually practically impossible. And so what we do instead is we take as big a sample as we can and we do some math that we're going to learn in the next couple of chapters and StatCrunch is going to do for us to basically say instead something like, well, since we took a sample of this size and, and when we look at the sample value of the average value of heights, for example, of students, and we know that when you take different samples, it looks like this. And that in general, we would expect that 90% of the sample means that we get would be within a certain range from the actual population mean 90% of the time. That means that we're 90% sure that the sample that we got is within that range from the population. And so I can say something like, I'm 90% sure based on my sample that the actual mean height of all students at DVC is between 5'4 and 5'10 or whatever the range is that we would get. So we will be making exact statements, but they will be probabilistic, meaning they will make a probability statement about how sure we are that the actual value we're trying to investigate is within a certain range. That'll be the end result and it will be very precise and very accurate, but it's still a probability statement. I'm 90% sure. Now, we will be able to have ways to make that a surety larger. If you need to be more sure than 90%, you can become 99% sure. But to do that, you either need to have more people in your sample, or you need to have a wider range that accounts for more possible error. So you will have some flexibility in what kind of a statement you make. But that's where all of this is heading us. Does that help? Uh, understand this a little better? Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. It's tough. And we're, we're just beginning down that road. And so that's why it's most challenging right up front. But the more we look at it and the more we see how we use it to do problems, hopefully it can make more sense to you.
But in the very beginning, you want to fight to try to understand the ideas behind what we're doing, because then the little results in the formulas can be interpreted correctly. And that's the key. You're not going to have to do the fancy math crunching formulas and calculators will do that. But the ideas need to be well enough understood so that we can interpret the results the calculator gives us and understand what that's telling us about the population. So in the next slide, we see things are a little interestingly different. So now they are talking about sampling variances. Remember the variance is the square of the standard deviation. Well, we could use the same idea. We could take a sample from our population. We could uh, examine each of the sample variances and make a big list. And then we could make a distribution of sample variances. And what they're telling us is that what we see is that sample variances tend to have a skewed distribution. So it's not strictly normal. It's not symmetric. It does kind of lump up, but it doesn't lump up in the middle. It has a skewed lump and a, and a tail that's uh, right skewed. So we have to take that into account if we're trying to use the variances of samples to give us an idea of what the variance of a population might be. Uh, this can be confusing, so just look at the first two first. All right, so now I think we're going to try to give some definitions with having tried to state these ideas. They're going to introduce notations so that we can refer to these different things. Sampling distribution of a statistic is the distribution of all values of the statistics when all possible samples of the same size n are taken from the same population. all possible samples of the same size. So for students at DVC, I would literally talk about a distribution if I took 100 students of every possible different way I could take 100 students. Now, practically, that's even harder than just sampling the whole population. So this is a theoretical discussion to help us understand how a particular sample we might get might relate to the actual value of the population. But a sampling distribution is a theoretical distribution of all possible samples. And it doesn't have to be theoretical. Of course, we could just look at a very small population and look at all the possible ways to sample it. And that's basically what your homework problems do. Your homework problems basically make restrictions to very small populations. And they literally talk about every different way you could take a sample from that population and look at how the results of that distribution would turn out. And that's why there's not a lot of homework problems on our homework like that, because they are a little bit involved. And I did one for you very thoroughly with lots of explanation that took about 20 minutes in the videos online. Um, so, but in general, there's no way we'd want to talk about all the different ways I could take 100 students from a population of 10,000 students or something like that. But that's what we are talking about theoretically with a sampling distribution of a statistic. So the sampling distribution of a statistic is typically represented as a probability distribution in the format of a probability histogram formula or table. So that's their definition. So for a proportion, the sampling distribution for a sample proportion specifically, like what percentage of the group are Democrats or are male or are over the age of 21 or something like that. That's the distribution of sample proportions. And so they're going to use P hat, as I mentioned earlier, where the hat means that the proportion that you're talking about 50% came from a specific particular sample. And we're going to consider all samples having the same size once you've chosen it, sample and you can't take one sample of 15 and another sample of 20. You have to stick to the same size. The sampling distribution of the sample proportion is typically representing represented by a probability distribution in the format of a histogram formula, often a graph. So this is the sample of all the p hats. And proportion for the entire population would be a p without the little hat symbol above it. Then you're talking about the entire population's proportion. Ah, well, they just define that on the next slide. 
So P equals the population proportion and P with the little hat is the proportion from a particular sample. Similarly, if you are looking at a population mean, they use a big X and when they use a sample mean, they'll use X with the little bar on top. So X with the bar, P hat, those represent statistics, meaning values from a sample, not parameters, which would be the value from the entire population. So as we've been discussing, the behavior for sample proportions, the distribution of sample proportions tends to approximate a normal distribution, meaning they lump together around the mean value of those proportions. Then they say the sample proportions target the value of the population proportion in the sense that the mean of all the different sample values you could get is equal to the population proportion, as I was discussing earlier. So when that's the case, when the mean value of all the different ways you could take samples is equivalent to the value for the population that you're investigating, then they say that the samples target the value from the population. That means that they are more likely to be close to the actual population proportion than not. So now let's just use these ideas um, with an example for discussion. Sampling distributions of the sample proportion. Consider repeating the process, roll a die five times and find the proportion of odd numbers, one, three or five. So I rolled the die and I looked at the number and I'm just considering was the number odd or not? Yes or no, when I roll it five times. So how many times could I get an odd number if I rolled a die five times? Well, zero, one, two, three, four, or five. What do we know about the behavior of all sample proportions that are generated as this process continues indefinitely? So if I were to just keep doing this, and I think of again and again and again and again, I just roll five times, roll five times, and I think of all the different ways that I would get a sample of rolling a die five times and look at what proportion were odd. So every time I roll the die five times and count up the number of odds and look at what portion of my five rolls, I would get maybe zero, maybe one out of five, maybe two out of the five. I would get some value like 0 0.2, 0 0.4, maybe a zero, maybe a one, maybe all five were odd. And if I took all of those and made a distribution as I did this, they're showing what they got from a sample where this was done 10,000 times. And what you can see is that the proportions of how many odd die you would get out of your five roll when they distributed them formed a normal distribution. So they're showing that in this graph here. And you could see that a small portion, all five were odd, a small portion, all five were even, but that more commonly you had two or three of the die rolls be even, I'm sorry, be odd. When you roll a die, you've got a 50% chance of getting an odd number. So if you roll a die, you would expect that something close to 50% of the rolls will come out odd. That in extreme situations, that may be not the case at all, but what's more common is that you get close to half of them are odd. The expected value for how many times you would get odd is two and a half out of five times. But of course, you can never actually get two and a half out of five rolls be odd. You could, you could get two or you could get three, but not two and a half. So the two and the three, which are closest to the expected value, are most common. Questions? So what they say then is that the figure shows the sample proportions are approximately normally distributed. 
because all the values are equal, likely the proportion of odd numbers should be 50%. And the figure shows that the sample proportions have a mean of 50%. If you add those up, or you look at the average right in the middle, the mean value is 50%. And that's the true expected proportion value. That's the true probability of getting an odd number. Questions, comments, discussions? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop the slideshow here because we've only got about five or six minutes left. And I want to show you how this theoretical discussion, we're in 14 out of 31, so we're halfway through the slides. So they go on and on, talk about different things, as you can see. They do other examples, but notice there's not a lot of calculations here. This is all theoretical discussions. They finally give you a formula, which we will never use, <laughs> but they talk about targeting, et cetera, et cetera. And again, more pictures of examples where they did 10,000 trials. So there aren't a lot of things here where you are doing these things specifically yourself. So if that's the case, then what do they expect you to do on the homework? Well, they can ask you theoretical questions they can ask you about definitions, but what they, they do a couple problems like that, but actually they give you some very small samples and ask you to figure out all the different possible samples you could get. So let's take a look. So I'm gonna switch over to sharing my computer screen and take a look. So, um, I think I grabbed one of these, but it's not there anymore. It was like 20, 46, maybe. There we go. So looking at number 45 from our current homework, this is from 6.3. It says, when two births are randomly selected, the sample space for genders is boy, 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 girl, girl, boy, girl, girl. Assume that these four outcomes are equally likely. Construct a table that describes the sampling distribution of the sample proportion of girls from two births. Does the mean of the sample proportions equal the proportion of girls in two births? Does the result suggest that a sample proportion is an unbiased estimator? So this example problem is going through a much smaller example like the ones that they showed us, like flipping a coin five times. But in this case, having a kid and getting a girl is exactly the same as flipping a coin and getting heads because it's a 50% probability and you repeat it and they're just doing it twice instead of five times. So we have a much smaller example to work with. And so if I was looking at this problem, the three possibilities is I would get zero girls one girl or two girls out of my two kids. So my sample proportions would be, maybe I get zero girls, maybe I get 50% were girls, or maybe 100% were girls. And what is the probability? Well, the probability of getting no girls is the boy boy out of the four. So that would be one out of four. The probability of getting one girl would be boy, girl, or girl, boy. That's two out of four or one half. And the probability of getting 100% girls would be girl, girl, which is one out of four. So then they go on to ask us to discuss this. So in this case, we had to create the probability distribution for the different sample results we would get when we were taking a sample situation of having two kids and seeing how many of them, what proportion of them were girls. So this is a proportion sample. And some of the problems are more elaborate. And so these are gonna take time and that's why I wanted to let you know that I did a more elaborated example in which it took me about 20 minutes to go through and explain it very clearly. And we don't have time to do that in class, but that's why I shot a video of that. And I'm also showing how a lot of this stuff could be done in StatCrunch at the same time. 
So take a look at that video. That's the third video on the list of chapter six stat crunch videos. And that's where uh, I wanted to finish up today. So the, co the concept is challenging. It will take some time to understand it. Try to do that. Um, look at the example that I shot for you in detail to hopefully help you do at least one of your problems. But the harder problems in the homework are like that. And I kind of picked one of the hardest ones and just did it in detail. 